Okay, welcome to technical session number 11. Just a reminder, we do jump around on these technical sessions a little bit. Uh, we don't go specifically in order, just kind of like we don't go specifically in order in test outs. We're trying to marry up all of these subjects at the same time. So we do kind of jump around a little bit on certain subjects so that we can hold the path for the Coursera cert. So today we're gonna to be talking about power supplies. These wonderful, dangerous items inside of our computers that make everything work. Our objectives throughout this particular cohort, or not cohort, but technical session, are gonna to be to identify the characteristics of power supplies and the connectors that you will typically see on your average power supply. We're going to be able to select a power supply based on given specifications, describe how to remove slash install a power supply. Hint, it's similar to the instructions we have heard before. And also we're going to be going to be able to identify common problems that come up with power supplies and how to address them. BSMs we want to pay attention to with regards to this particular technical session is communication as well as growth mindset. Communication is critical on any given IT team, especially considering the fact that not all problems can be resolved within your shift. So as you are leaving, you need to be able to communicate quickly and concisely with your coworkers to let them know what has already been done, where you're at, what are the customer's expectations, when do they expect to hear from you, things like that. Also, we need to be able to communicate effectively with the customer. You know, sorry, I'm unable to resolve this issue. Currently, we are going to be working on resolving this problem going forward. You should hear something from me by end of business day or by tomorrow noon or by Monday of next week. Whatever the issue is, whatever your communication um, for this particular issue would dictate, you need to be able to convey that to the customer and follow through with that. All right. Big part of power supply, we need to understand, at least on a fundamental level, electricity. Do you have a question, Golly? Yeah, sorry. Um, probably a dumb question, but um, on the test, is it going to be like, you know, like a question like, oh, what is the key BSM that we use for this type of thing? No, the BSMs are more for us. That is more of a generation oh. thing because we're applying this stuff as we go through, reminding ourselves because we're developing those soft skills that are extremely valuable in the workplace. Remember how we talked about IT tends to have that reputation of being very poor communicators, terrible at customer service and stuff like that. Well, we don't want to yeah. be those people, right? No. We want to bring that added value to the team. So that's okay. part of why we remind ourselves with each technical session just a few, um, like two a day for each technical session. We try to weave them back in, remind us why we talked about them. How do they incorporate into our daily lives? Thank you. So not a stupid question. All right, so electricity in a basic sense is a flow of negative, negatively charged particles called electrons. And we need to have an understand of, understanding of voltage, amperage, and watts. So volts are like considered to be the pressure of electrons in the wire. So that is called voltage in itself. You can think about this almost like water traveling through a pipe, where the water is the voltage, the water is moving through that pipe. And then you have amperage, which is the electrons of, you know, moving on a wire called current. And then we have wattage, which we get watts by multiplying volts times amps. You need to pay attention to this stuff because, you know, volts, can kind of be a misnomer, but it's more the amperage that 
brings danger to the situation. As little as one or two amps can kill you. So you need to pay attention to the amperage. Um, one of my cousins, he's a pilot and he deals a lot with electricity and stuff like that. We're working on the engines and stuff like that. And it was always explained to him is you could swim in an ocean of voltage and be okay. But the amperage by which it's applied is where the danger comes from. Because remember, you can, you can hit, get hit by 10,000 volts just by touching a doorknob after shuffling your feet on the floor. Because remember, you, you can't see anything below 10,000 volts. So whenever you zap a, bolt, uh, uh, a doorknob and you see a little spark, that's 10,000 volts right there. But again, 1.52 amps properly applied can be fatal. So you think of the amperage as kind of the diameter of the pipe. So how big around is that pipe? The voltage is the water moving through it. The amperage is the diameter of the pipe. So if you have, you know, two pounds of pressure pushing water down a pipe and it's three feet around, that water's just gonna kind of ooze out the end of that pipe, right? But if we bring that pipe down to about a couple millimeters across, same amount of pressure, it can be pushed out at such a high speed, you can essentially cut through concrete with that same amount of pressure and water, right? And that's where you get your wattage. So that's your amps times your volts. And then to a lesser degree, we need to understand resistance of the flow of electrons, you know, how much is it, you know, or how much current does it need to actually get the electrons to move through? This is measured in ohms. You very seldom will use this, but it is just there. Understand that ohms measure the resistance of the medium you're working with, and which is typically copper wire with regards to electricity. Questions so far? Yes, Kevin. Um, so you can have like a whole bunch of volts and no amps, right? Like you can. Yeah, you can have a whole bunch of volts, but very little amperage. So you have like a really big, um, you have like, excuse me, like, a, you know, like I said about a bunch of water moving through a pipe, but if it's a really, really big pipe, it's not going to come out very strong, is it? Okay, so the 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 amp would be the pipe. Yeah, how big is that diameter on that pipe? Alrighty. So the amperage would, you know, you like you 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 lower the diameter, but you still have the same amount of pressure. It's going to increase the uh, velocity at which that voltage moves through, that water moves through that pipe. Okay, so so the the voltage is just is just it's the water. Yeah. Okay. So that's just that's just how it flows, mm -hmm. and how 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 fast it flows or whatever. Correct. Okay. Alrighty. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Golly. Um. So you said for the voltage. Um. So when you get like a static shock from a doorknob, you get like you see the volt, like you see the shock, or is it like you feel it? That's like the 10,000 Well, you volts. can't, like humans can't feel anything less than about 2,500 to 3,000 volts. When you feel the shock, it's at least that much. Okay. Right, it's 2,500 to 3,000 volts. If you could see it, like if you see that spark jump from your finger to the doorknob, that's 10,000 volts. Oh, okay. How much does it take to damage a computer component? A uh, 100 volt. A 100 volts. So you wouldn't even feel it, but that's enough to damage that computer component. So very good. All right, so how electricity flows. Two different types, depending on whether you're an Edison or Tesla fan, you know, you might feel an affinity towards one or the other. Um, Alternating current also oscillates between negative and positive voltage. 
So AC travels on a hot line from power station and the AC returns to the power station on a neutral line. And the neutral line is grounded to prevent an uncontrolled electricity in a short. In the United States, as we talked about earlier, we're somewhere between 110 and 120. They, sometimes we'll just call it 115. VAC for voltage al alternating current. Europe tends to use between 220 to 240. And that is how it comes out of the plug on the wall. So when you plug something in, it's based off of alternating current here in the US. It's 110 to 120, or it's you know, loosely called 115 VAC or voltage alternating current. Now, DC is direct current travels in one direction and it is the, the type of current that is used on your electronic devices. So you may be asking yourself, if all my electronic devices use direct current, but alternating current is what comes out of the wall, how do we get these two to talk? Good question. Power supply. So almost all electronic devices have something like this. The power supply itself converts the alternating current voltage to direct current so that the components in your computer can use that power. So power supply converts alternating current to direct current so that your power, your components inside the PC can use the voltage or the electricity coming out. Power supply also yeah. quick, you know, shortly called or, or, you know, abbreviated to PSU, which is power supply unit. Yes. Who had a question? Yes, Mr. Kelly. Is yes, Is it when it's converted, you know, like from analog to digital? No, you're talking about data at that point. No, we are oh. talking specifically about electricity. Oh, okay. So oh. the electricity is converted from alternating current, which is the type of electricity that comes out of your wall outlet. But your components inside your computer need direct current to work. Right. Oh, okay. So when gotcha. it go, the, the power goes into the power supply, the power supply converts it from alternating current into direct current before it sends that electricity through into the computer for you to use. No, okay. thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, again, as we talked about, 110, 220, those are your standard uh, voltages. On the back of your power supply, there's a little red switch. Because we don't want to make two different power supplies. We can just make one, right? Put a little switch on the back. That little switch can set the voltage to 110 or 220. So it knows what it's going to receive. We need to be aware of this selector switch because if we have it set for 110 and then we plug it in in Europe at 220, what do we think is going to happen? pop, blow, yeah, it's gonna fry it. So it's gonna receive way more voltage than it's expecting and you can damage the components inside because of this. Now flip the script on that a little bit. If we bring a computer from Europe to the US and it's set at 220 and we plug it in, what happens? Probably won't turn on. Yeah, it's, I mean, it may turn on. Yeah. It's, it's not gonna function properly, so. you know because it's not getting as much juice as it needs to function. So the selector switch on the back allows you to set for the region that you're in. What's nice is, is newer power supplies have an auto selector switch. So it auto senses once it receives that power, okay, I know what I'm getting. It automatically switches over and you're good to go. Older power supplies and the majority of them that are out there right now 
still have this selector switch on the back. We'll show a picture of it here in a little bit. So it is still there. But automatic switching is a thing on newer power supplies. Now, there are five different types of voltages that can come out of this power supply to help feed our uh, components so that they can work properly. I do not like the way they've set up this slide because it makes it um, a little bit confusing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna scratch this out, ignore this right here, okay? So, uh, so the five voltages we can use is positive 3.3 VDC, which is direct current, you can have positive five VDC, negative five VDC, positive 12 VDC, and negative 12 VDC. You're asking yourself, do I really need to know this? Yes, yes you do. Because when you're checking a multimeter against some of these components, you, will, you need to know what is considered a standard voltage and what would be considered not standard. Mr. Kelly, can you please repeat that? Sure. The five voltages that you can receive out of a computer are positive 3.3 <clears throat> VDC, positive or negative, so that's two of them, positive or negative 5 VDC, and positive or negative 12 VDC. So 3.3, positive or negative 5, positive or negative 12. And we need to know this so that if we are testing some components with our multimeter, that they are receiving the appropriate voltage. Based upon how the wires are coming out of here, see how they have the yellow, the black, the uh, orange, all that stuff, those, those wires would indicate specific voltages. But again, some newer ones, all the wires may be black or white or purple, or depending on the color scheme they're going for in their lap, their desktop, they may be different. But in the older ones, the wires actually indicated the voltages that were being run across them. <clears throat> Mr. Kelly, Mr. Yes. Kelly, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. For 110 VAC, what is the output of the DC current, sir? I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm sorry, one more time. Uh, um, if 110 is the input, right? Uh, what uh -huh. will be the output of the DC for 110 volts? So if we receive in 110 VAC, it breaks it down into cords which can supply these voltages. What about the 220 VAC? The same, same thing. thing happens? Oh, the, okay. the components inside either run off 3.3, positive negative five or positive negative 12. Okay. Thanks. Now, how much the power supply can put out depends on the power supply. Okay. But, you know, these are the parameters they work within. So these five different voltages. So yeah, it's positive 3.3. There's no negative 3.3. So positive 3.3. There's positive and negative 5 and positive and negative 12. Those are our five voltages. All right, the capacity that it can supply is measured in watts. Yes, Ebony. Um, okay, so you said it's five voltage, mm -hmm. right? That's but one of them, yes. But it's only three different numbers. So it's like, I don't understand that part. Three so what makes it three? five? You're going to write them out? Positive right? five, negative five, positive 12, and negative 12. So five total voltages. Does that make sense? OK, now it does. So you see, you have the plus and the minus over here. So that gives you two different voltages. You have the positive and then the negative. So 
Good question, though. Any other questions? All right, so capacity is measured in watts. And remember, as we saw back here, uh, go back one more. Watts is volts times amps, right? So the output <clears throat> or capacity on our power supplies themselves are measured in watts. So here's kind of how it works when it comes in. The 110 comes in from the wall right here. First, it converts it from AC to DC and then breaks it out into those fun little capacities that we need. And then that goes through our connector that we put on the motherboard, that P1 connector, which is, oops, which is right here. That's our P1, our 20 plus four connector right there. Yes, Golly. Um, on the uh picture said the so it's like positive five vsb does that like is that does that still mean vdc or is that mean Where something else vsb like on the on, now it's on the inside the power supply on the in the picture where it's yeah it said positive five uh v regulator yeah, five, positive five, five voltage. That's just the volts. Down, down, the one down, Kelly. Oh, the one right down here, is the regulator. V, yeah, it said VSB. SB. Regulator. So is the VSB stand for something else or is it still? Uh, supposed to yeah, be? I'm checking that real quick. That doesn't make. Standby voltage. So it'd be positive five standby. That would just be one way they would recognize it. Uh, so it's still it's still the same you know uh, VDC right like yeah it's thing. still five volts direct current okay all right should we ever see a power supply look like this no we shouldn't it should be open there you go should not be open it's usually full of these fun little batteries right here capacitors very, very dangerous. So, but they want to give us kind of a peek inside what it may look like. All right, here's that selector switch I was talking about. So you have the, the plug right here, you put in that IEC cable. You have your main power switch on the power supply. Then up here, you see this little red, um, it's this little red, Thing right here and that will be the selector switch and if it goes over one direction it's 220 the other it's 110 so you need to make sure that is set appropriately for your region that you're in hint that may show up in test out so that's that dual voltage selector switch we were talking about Make sure it's selected to the region you're in. Although some may select that power for you automatically. Here's it, it's a little bit clearer right here. You can see it has that 230 right here, which is that 220 to 230. And then up would be the 110. Yes, Greg. So just a quick question about test out. Um, you just mentioned something. So I always, you know, check that um, in the back of the computer and test out. However, when on, uh, do you get a bad score if you are powering down a machine? Um, you don't you don't press that switch in the back. You just basically unplug it. Is that still mm -hmm. fine, or should you always practice um, do the you know one zero in you know, on off switch? I do you not believe uh, mm -hmm. test out does not penalize you for that. Okay. All right. Thanks. So when you look on the back of the power supply, remember we have that IEC plug goes in right here and here is your main power or your hard power switch. So that's the main power switch on and off for your desktop. Now, <clears throat> many of you probably realize that you press that little button on the front of the tower, right? That's how you turn it on. That is called soft power. That front panel power button that you have, it's called soft power, 
which is why sometimes when you're turning off a computer, you know how they tell you to press and hold it for about 10 seconds and then the computer turns off. What's happening then is when you press and hold, it starts telling the BIOS to tell everything else, hey, we're shutting down, you need to stop whatever you're doing so that we can safely close down. So that's what they call it soft power in the front of the computer when you, when you turn it on. If you flip the switch on the back of the power supply, it instantly kills the power to everything. So that is a hard cutoff and you can damage components and your system by turning it off that way, if you turn it off from that hard power switch. So it's very rare that you would actually turn the computer off based off of that switch on the back. But more often than not, you're using the soft power switch at the front. Questions so far? Greg, do you have another question? You're just kind of hanging out like this. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, no worries. Soft power On, is important, so make a note of it. Yes, please remember that. <laughs> and Ella. Open. Yes, Ella. So this on and off switch is zero and, zero and one. Is it at the back of every PC? And the red one that alternates the voltage, is it mm -hmm. present in every PC? The every desktop should have, yes, this on and off switch here. This will be present in most computers. But remember, we said some computers do auto switching, which it automatically switches between the two based on the voltage it's receiving. So the, the, the uh, red switch would be on most computers. This, the on and off, the one zero switch would be present on all desktops. When you, you say most supply. computers, do you mean laptop and desktop? No, I'm speaking strictly about desktops with this. I think it's the opposite, man. Um, especially sure I have like 20 computers here. And um, I'm looking at one right now. It doesn't have the switch, but it, I know that all of them have that regulator, though. You know, the, I mean, the the red, the red um, slide. So they all have the red, but mo the yeah. ones you have do not have this one back here? Some of them, yeah, because, you know, I'm, I'm a, I used okay. to work in a Dell shop. So uh, Dell's usually, you know, usually the older stuff don't don't have it unless it's like a tower. Or if it's um if it's a desktop, mm -hmm. um, not the towers. Um, the uh, I, I keep forgetting the name of it, but if um are even a small form factor ones, um, yeah. they don't have the switch. Well, yeah, on the small ones, I would say yeah, you're probably you're probably correct, but almost every tower I've seen has it. Yeah, and these are the factors. So I mean, I think all it has similarities. All it us. But yeah, like the mini I, little, like the little desktops you're talking about, Greg. Yeah, you probably you. Probably right because they're going to be using a much smaller form factor power supply as well. Excuse me, Kelly. Yes. Uh, funny thing, I just checked my desktop, but it doesn't have either of the switches or either of the two. So why would that be? Well, you probably your power supply probably has auto switching, and do you have a full tower or do you have a smaller PC desktop or are you operate on a laptop? No, regular system unit. The the regular one with the case, the big case. Okay. The Toa. The Toa has it. If you are using Toa, you, you're gonna have it. But I think well, you are not using Toa. Uh, I just checked now. I didn't see. It. Okay. We'll we'll go with most then. <laughs> okay. We'll go with most. Oh, there's another thing you know. too. Um, because uh, yeah, I've been messing with them for a long time without knowing <laughs> that I shouldn't open up this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. and some of these um. Well, especially Dell. If you open up the the the, the box, sometimes the switch is actually inside um, to okay. turn it off and on. If you you know if you want to mess with it, they have like a switch in there to kill it. Um, some of them, some of them do. I forgot okay. to mention that one too. Okay. Or like a reset button, that little red button. Sometimes you see red or black. <clears throat> yeah, I have seen that. Yeah. I haven't seen the switches on the inside of the case. Granted, the office that I worked at, where we had a bunch of computers, they were you know. The, the newest computers are about a decade old. So, you know, my, my perspective could be a little skewed on this. All right. 
cables and connectors. So the main one we want to, you know, that's the most easily recognizable is the P1 power supply, which is a 20 or a 24, or what is called a 20 plus four. As you can see right here, this one has that four pin kind of unclipping. So that can happen in that little four pin connector can actually go over and power on the CPU in some cases. And this provides the majority of the power to the motherboard itself. So some motherboards will require special connectors for their CPU and they can either be a four, six or eight pin connector. It will look something like this square connector as we remember um, when we were going over the motherboard geography that that CPU power supply connection. <clears throat> Others we will come familiar, familiar with, we have our four pin Molex right here. That typically is five and 12 volts for IDE drives or floppy drives, older uh, mechanical drives, things like that. Requires a firm push to plug that in. A lot of times I'll have like a little clip on it. You'll hear that as you plug it in. Then you have the newer mini four pin connector that supplies five volt and 12 for 3.5 floppies and fans. You know, obviously we don't see many 3.5 floppy drives anymore. Um, although I'm, I'm on the search for one myself, but uh, also used for your powering your drives and your fans as well. All right, SATA connectors. You will see many of these. So you remember we had the L-shaped red data SATA connectors or the SATA banks they had that little L shape to them. We were looking at the motherboard geography. Well, this is the power supply that goes to those same drives. This would be your SSD drives, newer floppy drives, things like that. You would hook up both your power supply here, your SATA power and your SATA data in order to get everything up and running. Then we have our PCI Express, where you have higher end video cards require more power than can be provided by the motherboard itself. So they will require their own individual connection and they typically will be six or eight pin connectors to provide extra power resources for the uh, graphics cards themselves. Questions, fun comments? Fun, fun fact about that one, the PCIe, I did buy a card. Um, you, you know, I told you about a four card thing for, um, for um, videos. Um, the problem I had here is that this isn't included um, with all power supplies, the PCIe. Correct. Yeah. So yeah, you have to pay attention to the connectors you have and the amount of power that they can generate. So those are two big factors you want to pay attention to when selecting a power supply. So good point, Greg. Yes, Dean. Professor, I just would like to know for the SATA connectors, there is one that has 15 pin. And mm -hmm. for the one that you just showed, it's like the L shape. Is there any difference between the 15 pin and the L shape connector? But this one and the red one we were looking at earlier? Oh, yes, this one. And well, this was... one here just supplies power. Mm -hmm. The other one we were looking I... at before that had that L shape, that's your data line mm -hmm. for those drives. So this oh, specifically okay. just provides power to the drive. The other one is how the data is transferred back and forth. Yeah, and that is 15 pin, the one that you saw before. Mm -hmm. yep. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, here are connectors and gives you various pinouts and voltages for every kind of connector or the majority of the kinds of connectors you may come across. I know what you're thinking. Do I have to memorize this stuff? Do I have to know the pinouts and voltages of every pin that goes into a connector that hooks up to my computer? No, no, you do not. At least be familiar with being able to look at a schematic 
and understand because it a lot of you know on here it kind of gives you the colors of the wires you get the orange the blacks the reds the greens the blues and each voltage correlates with a type of wire so when you're using a multimeter you understand that you're getting the correct voltages out of it so being aware on how to look at a schematic and kind of just get what it's telling you is majority of what you should get out of this slide but no we do not have to memorize this stuff It's also important to know that that standby voltage, that positive five that we were talking about. Oh, yeah. About, right there, the purple one. Yeah, because I've seen that like mm -hmm. on questions. There's a, uh, a nice feature called Wake on Land, where you can send a trickle of power into a computer and wake that computer up, even if it is shut down. And that's where that standby voltage would come into play. So thank you for that, Rachel. So yeah, we do need to be aware of it, what that's for. And it's so we can set up our computer to be able to be woken up if we're not there. It's kind of a nice feature if you're traveling and like, oh my goodness, I forgot my presentation at home. I need that information. Otherwise this trip is useless. You can be able to send that signal in to your home computer, turn it on, remote in, access your files, and then still be okay. So thank you for that. Sir, could you or, please explain one more time? Sorry to improve. No problem, no problem. So standby Sorry. power. That's that five volts here, standby power. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it is kind of a trickle of power that kind of keeps things ready to turn on. And then if you wanted to do what's called a wake on land, it could send a, you know, signal to that bolt, allowing things to turn on so that you can remote into your computer. If you're not there, you can turn the computer on not while you're not present. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, Greg. All right, I have a question about uh, one of the slides. I'm, I'm doing a self-paced um, bit here, just going through making sure I cover it all. Um, this one here that says, um, some motherboards require special four, six, eight pin connectors to supply extra power. Um, so the 20 plus four, if, if the four isn't enough, do you have to get another? It, it, uh, that part, I'm not sure if I follow because- So you're talking about like for like the CPU? Yeah, the CPU works. Yeah, sometimes that, well, yeah. sometimes you may use the full 24 and mm -hmm. then still have a four, six, or eight go in for the CPU. Okay. So the, okay. So it can be would, the same or it can be additional depending on the needs of the motherboard you have. Okay. So you have to basically shop for um uh so power supply that has that extra power if that CPU requires more. Correct. Okay. All right, understood. But we'll we will get into that when we talk about selecting power supplies and stuff like that. What you know, some of the stuff you need to look for. Okay. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So form factor. What did we say form factor was? What's well, that's just a fancy way of saying shape and size. size. Shape and, and size. size. There we go. Form factor. Just fancy way of saying size and shape. So this will determine what size power supply we need to use the placement of the screw holes so that we know that it will, it will fit inside the casing that we already have uh, that we use to anchor it to the actual case. So your typical ATX has the, was it the 150 by 140 by 86? That's the typical power supply size. And then, um, comes with a multitude of cables. Again, it's gonna depend upon your needs and your motherboard, what kind of connectors you're gonna be looking for on a power supply. And I know what you're thinking. You're sitting there going, please, please tell me there is a test out lab that, will, that we will get to do where we can sit there and look through multiple power supplies and find the one with the right amount of connectors and power needs to supply our computer. You're welcome. Yes, we have a test out lab that will fit this particular requirement. All right, mini and micro ATX boards have smaller power supplies to fit the smaller needs of the cases that they're attached. And uh, so basically 
knowing your case and motherboard, make sure that the form factor fits what you already have. Is this where you're taking over or no? I think it's actually Is it the next, the next one. It's the next no one, sorry. Okay, no problem. <laughs> I said 16, so I wasn't sure. All right, so rails. So power supplies, DC current is split into what are called three primary DC voltage rails. You have the 12 volt rail, the five volt rail, the 3.3 volt rail. So each rail has a maximum amount of power that it can supply, you, you know, but some more modern computers, we, we have much higher power consumption needs with our computers. And they, the components they have may have stronger power current requirements than each rail could provide. So some compute, you know, power supplies will come with multiple 12 volt rails with over power protection or OCP, which allows you to balance the circuitry and supply the required power to certain needs like high end graphics cards, things like that. These can draw a lot of juice. We want to make sure that we can supply them with what they need, but we have to work within the constraints that the power supply can provide. So today, modern PSUs, you can have single or multi-rail uh, functionality. You need to understand the needs of the PC you have so that you know you're selecting the right unit for your needs. You don't want to undercommit and you don't want to way overcommit because then you're just needlessly spending money. So you need to kind of find that, that need level where you, where you should be. All right. Is this your slide? Yes. All right. It is. <laughs> With that, I'm going to graciously hand it over to Rachel. Do you want me to stop sharing so you can share and you can just move from your own screen? Um, yeah, I guess so. I just had a question. Sure. How does it become the teacher's view or is that automatic? Is yours a student view? I can't tell what it is. You are live. So now we're going to talk about wattage capacity. And what I'd like to is get some class participation and have a volunteer to come on mic to read the first bullet point. And I can't see everybody. So I think I see Steven. <clears throat> yeah, uh, wattage capacity is a power supply that has a wattage rating for total output, maximum load. For example, 500 watts, 850 watts, or 1,000 watts, and individual wattage ratings for each of the vo voltage output circuits. Thank you. And can I have another volunteer for the second bullet point? Mitchet, please. Um, this wattage, is that the one I need to read? Yes. These wattage capacities are listed in the documentation and on the side of a power supply. Thank you. And the third bullet point, Mohammed. Video cards draw the most power in a system from the plus 12 volt output. Yes, and that is absolutely correct. They draw a lot of power. Now, if we consider, we're trying to determine the wattage capacity. So if we consider all components inside the case, including USB and FireWire devices, there are a list here of what approximate wattage there needs to be. And when you're looking at a power supply unit, you need to at least get 30% more than what you need. It's almost like if an illustration is like we need 200 calories a day to eat. And if we don't have enough calories, we won't have the energy, we'll be tired and there's no reserve. So 
if you have components that need about a thousand watts and there needs to be an additional 30% for the power supply unit that you use, how many watts would you need? So you have a thousand. 133 or something like that. 100, 333. Or 1300. Yes, the dyslexia just kicked in. It's yes. okay. <laughs> I followed. <laughs> 1300 and that's so that you know if you add you other components it. you know there you will have enough to support those components because sometimes cpus can run off of 12 volts hard drives 12 volts pci e's and cds and dvd drives as well it's just something to think about Now, do we recognize any of these connectors here? Yes. Can you just let everybody know which ones you recognize, Greg? We have the number theta. Five, uh, number four, well, number six is theta. Then we have the P15 uh, fan connector for a, what is that one, three? Uh, <laughs> uh, we have the, the P plus four, I'm sorry, the, the 20 plus four, that number two is the four that goes with that. And then this one here, number one is the Molex. Um, so number three. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, okay, so everybody's looking at the image right here. All of these, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, let me just see if it will show you. Is this a little bit better? So there's four pin power. Six pin augs. Okay. There's six pin auxiliary power. Okay. Molex four pin. And SATA or SATA, like you said. But also there's, you know, the floppy drive, which we don't deal with much anymore. I had a question before um, when when um, Kelly was uh, presenting because I wasn't sure if I could interchange the floppy with fan because that's what I, yes. I, okay, that's what it is. Okay. It's, also, it's a four pin power, but they can be used for fans, which you do hear it used for fans, but it can also be used for uh, older floppy drives and things like that. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now we have a match game. You're going to match the description with the image. You want to click the teacher box at the top and oh, then that's where it is. Names okay. at the bottom right. There we go. Thank you. Uh-huh. I do that all the time. And it might take you many tries, and that's okay. I promise you. Yeah, uh, Mr. Kelly. Yes. Oh, Miss Richard, I don't have access to you know matching the your answers to the to the conference. Okay. Again, um, did you click on the link in the beginning when we started talking? I'm putting it in chat right now. This link. Oh, thank you.
about how long, how much time should I give? Another two minutes. Okay. Give everybody a fair shake. I should pause the recording. Okay, so now steps to remove or install a power slide. Can I go back? Yeah, I'll try to bring that there. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Hey, mine was wiped out. Don't, yeah, don't worry about it. You don't have to redo it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we're just going back for the image. Each time you go, it resets it so that you can try again. Okay, everybody have it now? Thank you. You're welcome. Steps to remove or install a power supply. To remove the power supply, number one, turn off the power supply switch and unplug the AC cable very important. Number two, unplug the power supply lines to the motherboard drives and the carts. Number three, remove the power supply from the case. Look for screws that attach the power supply to the computer case. Be careful not to remove any screws that hold the power supply housing together because we don't want to mess with those. And to install a new power supply, we follow the same steps in the reverse order. Any questions about that? I got one. What's something we might want to add to step one? That's a good question. Oh, the, button down. Oh, the, button the power button. Down. Down. Five seconds. There we go. Very good. Because when we hold it down for five seconds, what happens? It's telling the system to stop what you're doing. And it gets rid of the residual electricity. Okay, now we have time to climb. And this is where I'm uncertain about how the sound is going to be. I wouldn't worry about it. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'll wait for everyone to connect. I forgot how many participants we have. 33, okay. Look for a good solid number in the high 20s. Okay. Okay, so I see about 29, so I'm going to go ahead and start. So which of the following is a consideration when purchasing a power supply with the correct wattage? Oh, I advanced it. <laughs> it'll auto it'll auto cycle through questions if you go back to it. Okay. I was waiting for it to go on. It waits until like it has a timer that goes down, or if everybody answers, whichever goes first. Okay. So yeah, it took me a while to get used to that myself. I apologize, guys. Okay, let me pause the recording. Thank you. 